Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Jesus, take my life and lead me on. Oh, Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Let me be to you a sacrifice. And I will praise you, Lord. And I will sing of love come down. And as you show your face, we'll see your glory. You have my heart, and I will search for yours. Jesus, take my life and lead me on. Oh, Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Let me be to you a sacrifice. I will praise you, Lord. I will praise you, and I will sing of love come down. I will sing of love come down. And as you show your face, we'll see your glory. Hello and welcome to Woolley United Reformed Church. If you've been following our services over the past few weeks, you'll know that we've been taking in the view from the hill. That's the Jesus view from his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. He's been speaking to us directly as he's pronounced these blessings or beatitudes. They've been reaching us on an individual level. And every step of those Beatitudes directs us even more closely to God and to his purpose for our life. When we hear in the first Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, then we recognise ourselves and our own spiritual poverty. And then when we hear that blessed are those who mourn, we can sense Jesus speaking to us and we know for ourselves what it's like to feel sorrowful over our sin. And as Jesus' teaching proceeds, we can picture ourselves submitting to God in meekness. And we are familiar with that longing of hunger and thirst after righteousness. And last week, when we thought about blessed are the merciful, well, whilst we admit that we could be more merciful, we probably do see ourselves as showing mercy to others as we remember God's mercy to us. And then we come to the sixth beatitude, which we're going to look at today. Blessed are the pure in heart. And it's at that point that we might well be tempted to say, OK, this is where I get off. This is a step too far. Being pure in heart sounds wonderful, but it also seems like an impossible dream. Well, Fliss is going to take that impossible dream and help us uncover what Jesus means by it when he says that later in our service. But all of this 
all of these Beatitudes are encouraging us and leading us on in our discipleship. They're drawing us closer to God. The Beatitudes allow Jesus to speak to us as individuals because he is deeply interested and involved in our lives. His view from the hill is there so that we might come close to him. In the words of an ancient prayer by Richard of Chichester, we pray, O holy Jesus, most merciful redeemer, friend and brother, may we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen. Welcome to worship. Verses 1 to 6 of David, a psalm. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol, or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord, and vindication from God their Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Amen. Today I'm reflecting on the verse from Matthew 5, 8, which reads, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I want to start by thinking about what the phrase pure in heart might mean. One of my favourite stories is the legend of King Arthur, and this phrase reminds me of one of Arthur's knights, Sir Galahad. He is described as Galahad the pure of heart, and it is said that Galahad was the only one worthy of the Holy Grail, being pure of heart and righteous. And then I started thinking that in stories, TV shows and popular culture, 
The phrase pure of heart often means that people with pure hearts will have the chance to access things less pure-hearted people can't. So I was thinking things like the ability to wield certain weapons or other magical items, the power to cast certain spells or travel to places, and immunity to certain enchantments. They have heroic willpower. But while these stories portray the pure of heart as wonderful brave heroes, what does this phrase mean for us as Christians today? When I read this sixth beatitude, my first reaction is to think that's impossible, that's not very much like me. And when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who recognise their need for God, it's not very hard to say, well, that's me. And when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, it's easy for us to think of our sins and shortcomings and say, yeah, that's me. But when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, I don't find myself saying, that's me. And I don't expect you do either. The reason for this, I think, is our humanness. We are not like those perfect heroes found in fairy tales. We make mistakes. We fail morally, spiritually and practically. And that's perfectly OK. And I think is expected by God. Purity of heart does not mean that you never have a bad thought. The Apostle John in 1 John verses 1 to 8 says, if we are say we are without sin, we deceive ourselves. Purity of heart does not mean sinlessness of life. Instead, I think that Jesus is speaking about the heart of someone whose sins have been forgiven and whose heart has been made new, whose purity comes not from themselves, but from the presence of Jesus in their lives. I believe the heart is utterly crucial to Jesus. What we are and who we are in the deep, private recesses of our lives is what he cares about most. Jesus didn't just say, blessed are the pure, but he said, blessed are the pure in heart. Jesus did not say, blessed are those who look pure, who say pure things, who talk about purity, who teach about being pure. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. And here is the difference. It's our hearts, our innermost thoughts, Sure, we can behave pure on the outside, but if we're not pure in our hearts, there's a problem. Jesus did not come into the world simply because we have some bad habits and need to be broken. He came into the world because we have hearts that need to be purified. And I think it's a work in progress where both us and God are responsible. We find many verses in the Bible that show how God cleanses us by pardoning our sin. But our responsibility in this cleansing is important and is frequently mentioned along with what we must do to be cleansed. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. And in 1 Peter verses 1, 22, it says, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, Love one another deeply from the heart. Love one another deeply from the heart. If we do nothing else, this is key. After all, the most important commandment is to love our neighbour and to love God. Love each other. We all need a bit more of that. God is interested in the heart of his followers. He's interested in what's going on inside, on our innermost thoughts and feelings. The feelings that nobody else knows but God. And how wonderful it is that he's interested in all these feelings. So what does it mean to see God? I mentioned earlier that the phrase blessed are the pure in heart is not one I would say is very much like me. But the second thing that seems equally impossible is the phrase they shall see God. What does that mean? In the Old Testament, Moses wanted to see the glory of God, so God told him to hide in a rock. God's presence would pass by, but Moses would only be allowed to see the afterburn of God's glory. God said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Yet here, Jesus is saying, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's seemingly impossible to be pure of heart and to see God. But this is how great a saviour Jesus is. Jesus does not give us the Beatitudes to mock us. 
they are possible in Jesus. He comes as the great redeemer, the rescuer, the saviour, holding this wonderful promise in his hands. This is the wonder of our redemption in Jesus, a promise that we will be welcomed into the very presence of God and see him face to face. And I wonder what we will see in his eyes. Can we even imagine what that will be like? In heaven, the barrier between human beings and God will forever be gone. To look into God's eyes will be to see what we've always longed to see, a person who made us for his own good pleasure. Seeing God will be like seeing everything else for the first time. Because not only will we see God, but he will be the lens through which we will see everything else, people, ourselves, and the events of our lives. While of course this is something to look forward to, I also believe that we can see God here on earth. God isn't angry when we enjoy a good meal, a football game, a cosy fire or a good book, and he's not up in heaven frowning at us and saying, stop it, you should only find joy in me. This would be as foreign to God's nature as it would be if we gave someone a gift and started pouting because they enjoyed it too much. We gave the gift to bring joy to them and to us. And if they didn't take pleasure in our gift, I'd be disappointed. Their pleasure in my gift draws them closer to me and I am delighted that they enjoy it. And I think God's just like this. God is a lavish giver. We can enjoy the people and the things God has made and in the process enjoy the God who designed and provided them for his pleasure and ours. God welcomes prayers of thanksgiving for meals, for fires, for games, books, relationships and every other good thing. And when we fail to acknowledge God as a source of all good things, we fail to give him the recognition and glory he deserves. So when we have our hearts cleansed by Jesus, we see God in our lives. In other words, we have a greater understanding of God and we know him better. We will recognise his hand in, their day, in our daily lives and throughout creation. Every day we can see God in his creation, in the food we eat, the air we breathe, the friendships and pleasures of family, work and hobbies. But we should thank God for all of life's joys, large and small, and allow them to draw, draw us to him. This is exactly what we'll do in heaven, so why not start now? So as we strive to be pure in heart, like Sir Galahad and all those other heroes, we should stop thinking it's impossible and remember that it's made possible through Jesus. For all things are possible with God.
Loving God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you full of thanks for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. He guides us, teaches us, and reassures us. How wonderful this is. He taught us that blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see you. He encourages us to do everything with pure intentions, with love. Father, it is a struggle for us to do this. We need to work hard to control the Pharisee in us that makes us feel superior to others and our feelings of pride. Help us constantly to work to make our hearts pure so that our actions express exactly what is in our hearts. When we fail in this, please forgive us. Father, please take away all the things that prevent us from seeing you. Take away our pride, take away our anger, take away our jealousy, take away the stress that clouds our vision. Help us to see you in everyone we meet and everything we do. Draw near to us and purify our hearts. Help us to love like you, to love one another deeply from a pure heart. Give us hearts brimming with joy and peace that are firmly rooted in you, whatever happens. Give us hearts free of doubt, free from doubt in your faithfulness, free from doubt in your perfect plan for each of us, free from doubt in ourselves and our gifts which have been given to us by you, free from doubt in others. Father, give us hearts that expand to welcome and nurture the lonely, the hurting and the weak. Father, give us hearts that break, as yours does, at the suffering of others and at the hurt people cause each other. We bring before you now, in the silence of our hearts, our petitions for peace, especially between Israel and Palestine for all those who are suffering, for protection for the vulnerable, and all those in need of your comfort, love and blessing. Father, give us a love of purity and truth and help us to live our lives treating everyone we meet with love. May your pure light shine on our hearts, dispelling every shadow, every fold that conceals or pretends. And may we praise and worship you always for your great love and generosity to us, for the beauty of your creation and for the example and teaching of our Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
you for joining us today from all our different places. This Sunday service has been marking something of a turning point for us. For over a year now, we haven't been able to meet in person as a congregation and we've all missed that fellowship that we enjoy together. And our online services like this one have given us the opportunity to continue to grow in our faith and in our discipleship. And we're so grateful to God for the technology that has allowed us to do that. But as restrictions are eased that little bit more this week, this is the last of our pre-recorded services. And next Sunday, we resume meeting at 11 o'clock in church. Next Sunday is also Pentecost Sunday, and that marks the beginning of the church in New Testament times. And it does feel like something of a new beginning for us all, doesn't it? So next Sunday, we'll be here in the church building at 11 o'clock. And if you'd like to attend in person, I can assure you, you will be made very, very welcome. Just remember to bring a face mask with you and when you arrive and when you sit down to allow others plenty of space. And it will be just great to see the church with lots of people in it. Now, if you can't be here in person, never fear. You can join us via our live stream. So tune in just before 11 o'clock next Sunday morning using the link to our YouTube channel. And you can find that link in the weekly email that we send out every Saturday. If you don't currently receive that, let me know via the email address that's on the screen and we'll make sure that you receive that from now on. You can also find the link on our website it's on our Facebook page, or you can find it by searching on YouTube for Wooler URC. And if you can't join us live at 11 next Sunday, you can still catch up with a recording of the service at a time to suit you. This is another big step in technology, and it's going to be new to us, and we expect there will be some hiccups. We hope you enjoy those as much as we do. Bear with us, we would ask you. We're all on a learning curve and we'll try and smooth things as soon as we can. But however you join us, the welcome remains the same. Warm and friendly and open to everyone. We'd love to see you either in person or online. So this week, if you're catching up with friends and family, we hope you have a great time. Keep safe and we look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, God bless.
Oh, say.